Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this ACT webinar on the evolution of FX risk management, a journey through the company life cycle. My name is Peter Matter. I'm the Engagement Director at the ACT, and I'm pleased to be your moderator of this webinar. today. The webinar this afternoon is going to be talking through a variety of business lifecycle events that can stress test a company's FX risk strategies. First of all, though, I'd like to introduce you to our webinar and how the process works. There's a menu bar across the bottom of your screen that allows you to open various windows and you can move these around your screen, resize them or minimize them. The green button with the question mark on it at the bottom is there for help if you have any technical difficulties. And another button opens the Q&A window. You can send in your questions by typing them in that Q&A window. Please don't wait until the end to send in your questions. Just send them to us as they occur to you and we'll deal with them at the end of the presentations. Our practice is that we don't disclose any names when asking the questions. I should add that the recording of this webinar will be available on the ACT website in a couple of days' time, along with a separate copy of all the slides. Our agenda today, following this introduction, is that there will be a joint presentation from our good friends and sponsors, Chatham Financial and Essential. And I'd like to introduce to you Anne Goyen, the Risk Management Advisor from Chatham Financial, and Steve Bonlam, who's the Group Treasurer at Essential. We will follow their presentations, or rather their joint presentation, with a panel discussion and then the Q&A. But as I said before, if you could have your questions prepared and ask them during the various sessions, I will try and get to them all as we go through the process. So first of all, I'd like to uh, welcome Anne and ask her to lead us off. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, before we dive into the discussion on um, evolution of next risk management today, um, I'll just take a quick minute to introduce you to Chatham Financial for those of you who are not as familiar with our firm. Um, for 25 years now, Chatham Financial has approached the debt and derivatives market um, as an independent expert in providing risk management solutions across interest rate, currency, and commodity. Um, and we serve approximately 1,800 clients globally um, in a wide variety of industries by providing solutions to strategic risk assessment, um, hedging strategy and execution, um, holistic hedge accounting, and also our SaaS application, Jam Direct, for total currency risk management. Um, today, I have with me Steve Von Lam from, from Essential as well. So Steve will quickly give a, a, an introduction to Essential as well as relevant background for, for the webinar today. Thank you, Anne. Um, as Anne said, I'll just give a brief history of the group over the past eight years. The current essential group was born out of the previous um, business called EMAP. EMAP was historically a wide-ranging media business that owned both consumer and B2B publishing titles, as well as events and data businesses on the B2B side and owned commercial radio stations. In 2008, the consumer-facing businesses were sold and the remaining B2B businesses were acquired by Apex and Guardian Media Group and taken private, and EMAP was delisted from the stock exchange. The acquisition was a typical leveraged finance acquisition, which put in place a mixture of sterling and currency debt to reflect the currency mix of revenue, and the debt had both senior and mezzanine debt tranches. Attached to the debt was a pretty tight set of financial and non-financial covenants particularly a tightening leverage ratio. Following the recession a, during sort of 2008-2010, um, the company you know, weathered that um, fine, 
Um, but in 2012, a new management team was, was brought in which refocused the group towards top-line revenue growth and then took a transformation program of investments to equip the business, especially on the sales front, to grow revenue at a faster place. This revenue growth was also focused on international markets and we established entities within countries such as Brazil and China. By 2015, after a few years of high single-digit top-line revenue growth and a reduced leverage position, we could see to refinance at much more attractive interest rates and terms, and particularly take out the senior mezzanine debt as a single tranche of senior debt. In April 2015, we refinanced the business for a US-style term loan B debt structure, which was a high-yield loan instrument, but with bond-type covenant terms, i.e. very much reduced covenant terms. This was issued in both euros and US dollars, where markets were more established and to seek, the, the, uh, seek out the lowest overall interest costs. Lenders uh, were asset management funds rather than commercial banks. With further growth in 2015 and favorable IPO markets, our, our owners sought to partially exit their holdings for an IPO. Under the IPO, the equity investors sought a lower leverage of lower level of leverage, and such typical lenders are more commercial banks rather than asset management funds. We therefore refinanced business again through the Sunsica loan market. In both these recent refinancings, Chatham Financials has assisted in the FX strategy, execution, and FX policy considerations. Thanks, Steve. So um, we should take a quick look at the agenda for, for the next um, half hour of, um, of the discussion today. So the first part of the discussion would be um, on the risk management objectives and how that might change throughout a company's life cycle. Um, and as you can see, um, the experience that Steve brings from Essential um, is very relevant as a backdrop, as, as a case study for, for the discussion points on, on this part of the webinar as well. Um, the second part would be on risk man management tools and how the different tools that can be at your disposal might change over time um, during the different changes to the company in terms of capital structure and ownership structure, et cetera. And at the end, uh, like Peter has mentioned, we'll uh, cover the questions um, from the audience. Essential is a group is an example of how approaches to FX risk management change as a company moves from private ownership to public ownership. As a, as a, as a company um, goes through a different phase of its life cycle, uh, different considerations and also uh, different changes in focus occurs. So whilst we were under private equity ownership, the prime focus was on FX sensitivity of the, of the leverage covenant ratio rather than pick, uh, the profit loss accounts. We could separately look at performance management for, for using constant currency analysis so that the business's performance um, objectives could be analyzed separately. Under public ownership, with a much lower leverage position and much less sensitivity to covenants, there's much more focus on the P&L, both at EBITDA level and below EBITDA. Also, focus more, more so on margins and net cash flow. And given under public ownership we have different stakeholders, the discussion on FX is much wider given the wider shareholder base and also um, the following through equity and analysts. Certainly. So the clarity around risk management objectives um, is definitely very important for companies, um, no matter public or private, and whether they are going through a meaningful life cycle event or not. Um, I, I can certainly think of many different board meetings that I've been um, at part of or attended where there was a fundamental misalignment of t terminology or even definition, um, and as a result, understanding of what their priorities are. So it's very crucial to really think about this um, from the perspective of various stakeholders, not just external, but also internal um, across the companies from sales and procurement 
to um, even local financial directors and that might be concerned about local subsidiary performance as well. Um, so that's another key area that I think would be very important to highlight. Um, and uh, once the risk management objectives um, that are set across the companies that meet the requirements and uh, expectations of stakeholders and internal um, within the, com the company. Um, companies can then look at what are the, t the risk tolerance of the company and its stakeholders, what is the maximum swing due to FX that the board can accept, for example, um, or what is the maximum swing that the company can absorb without affecting the margin significantly. So these are the sort of questions that help tease out what are the actual metrics at risk that the company cares about. Yeah, so under private equity ownership, um, as you said before, the focus is really on leveraged covenants. And so um, the, the stakeholder consideration centered around preserving covenant headroom within the business. And also um, with a, a, a private equity ownership, um, they wish to have their FX exposure as part of a wider portfolio of investments, and so there's lesser requirements to hedge the value of earnings against currency movements. As we move into a, a public ownership world, um, the focus um, is much more highlighted on the EBITDA, net p &L, and earnings per share. Um, stake, stakeholders and analysts potentially have a, a, a wide range of views on what your FX policy should be, and um, also, uh, in their investment evaluation decisions, they really wish to understand the FX profile of the business into quite, quite a, uh, a detailed um, position. So the, really the first key stage is to focus on what are the FX-related components of the businesses, um, and that was, was very much a, a key focus and part of the IPO uh, discussions. And this is an area which we look at chassis assistance and validation as the components or FX exposures in a methodical framework. As you could see on the slide there, we have a few examples of what can be the different financial metric um, that companies might focus on to measure the level of impact of currency. So um, like Steve mentioned, a private company or, or a, a private equity owned um, company might be focusing more on EBITDA, for example, um, in relation to the enterprise value and equity value. Um, a more a publicly li listed company might um, pay a lot more attention to EPS or, or net, net income. Um, so these are certainly simplistic examples, but can raise um, the question of really we need to determine the, the, the key metric of concern. Um, and increasingly, we notice that a simplistic linear shock of a currency is no longer su sufficient to fully assess the impact of currency risk. And you, we're not in a world where you can say that um, we can hold everything constant and shock the dollar by 10% and see what happens to, you, to your EBITDA. Um, so more companies move toward a more robust um, value at risk metric to understand the magnitude of their risk more holistically. Once we have a more established risk management objective, um, companies can then develop a robust policy um, with the foundation of that objective and purpose of a, of a risk management strategy. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that policy cannot be static and requires periodic review and assessment, especially more, more so in times of important changes. Um, for example, in case of in case of a merger and acquisition, um, it's important for both parties to have this clear understanding of their approach um, to risk in order for an integration process to be successful um, upon the, the integration, uh, the merger. Um, meanwhile, in the leveraged buyout scenario, for example, increasingly we see private equity funds require a more thorough assessment of a target company's FX risk during the due diligence phase. Um, well beyond the historically simple linear shock of EBITDA, uh, given the interconnectedness of, um, of markets and uh, of the currencies that we live in today. So with that foundation of um, risk management objectives and the nuances that one might see across various different um, companies and risk profiles, 
we're going to move on to um, the second section of the webinar where we'll be discussing risk management tools and the different ways the companies might go about managing their risk once they identify the objectives and, um, and um, constraints. First off, um, here on the slide, you can see three big groups of, um, of tools um, that can be available to companies. Um, they are natural hedges, debt instruments, and derivative instruments. And um, actually, in a, in a recent survey by uh, Deloitte, I read a couple weeks ago um, of around 133 corporations of various sizes across um, the world, 89% of, um, of companies hedge using derivative instruments. 58% um, of them have natural hedges between revenue and cost in the same entities, and about 46% have natural hedges across entities. Um, and in those 133 companies, um, about 40 of them have foreign debt or use cross currency swaps to um, to manage the debt of uh, the currency of their debt. Um, so, Steve, at Essential, how have you thought about these different tools? Yeah, we've spent quite a bit of time trying to look at natural hedges. Um, whilst we historically had some underlying data, we didn't think it was sufficient at the time to um, base our current analysis on. So we did a, quite a big exercise in identifying our underlying revenue and costs. Um, the one thing we decided quite early was not to get blinded by sort of accounting related numbers, but actually go back further to the source data for underlying billings and actual payments made. And this, this is quite a significant piece of work, and, and you know, in, certain, in total, I imagine it's about 50% of the work we actually did um, when we looked at, at, at FAX exposures. Um, and then having you know, get, you gathered the data, we had then had quite a big debate about whether, in looking at natural hedges, whether you focus on EBITDA, whether you look at EBITDA-less CapEx inceptionals, or actually then go down towards net cash flow. And in practice, you look at all three, and hopefully they are sort of re relatively consistent um, in giving your answer, because different people have, will, will have different uh, objectives. Um, we also then, obviously, in, in looking at that, you know, had, had debate around sort of the currency mix of the debt instruments and also the currency mix of, of cash holdings. And you know, that, that, no, that can be quite important when you then start looking at accounting because of the different accounting treatments. Um, and then, you know, especially uh, in our first refinancing, we had a significant amount of um, uh, analysis around derivative instruments and the ability to create synthetic debt instruments for use of cross currency swaps. And um, precisely to these points around um, really taking a a deep understanding of um, what are the sources of exposures and what is the net exposures that a company um, is facing. Um, this is an example of a fictional company with EBITDA um, and uh, below EBITDA exposures. Uh, as you can see, um, if this company's primary focus is on EBITDA, um, you could see that the USD actually presents quite a significant amount of exposure and risk. Um, but if they also look at below the line items, um, tax and uh, interest expense, um, given that this company um, has additional debt in, in dollar as well, um, that provides a certain amount of offset and benefit uh, to um, really create a net position that's significantly lower than their peer EBITDA um, exposure. Um, this is a rather simplistic example, um, but many companies, in fact, um, have a lack of visibility of FX exposures to the extent of being able to determine what is really your net magnitude of risk um, and what is the constraint, if any, between hedging EBITDA versus net cash flow, um, and uh, that's certainly of, a, of a, an important concern to, to keep in mind. Um, with that in mind, uh, life cycle events, you know, such as debt issuance, refinancing, M&A, um, are also, in many cases, an opportunity uh, to hit the reset button on FX risk, like in the example that we just saw 
um, when the USD debt amount actually provides certain level of offset um, for the EBITDA or revenue, net revenue that the company generates in that market. Um, many companies would then ask the question of whether they could make decisions on um, capital structure um, and other structural changes uh, in their risk profile in order to optimize um, the net currency exposure um, picture. So one key decision is regarding the optimal debt currency mix. Um, you can see on this slide the various considerations that a company might face, um, EBITDA, net income, cash flow, for example, um, covenant, and some of these might actually be an important part of the decision of what currency do you ideally want your debt in. Um, I know that there are various other factors that we're not, um, we're not including in today's discussion, such as you know, tax or dividend structure and things like that. Um, but today, with the context of focusing on risk management, um, these are certainly um, a very good discussion um, to have as well. Um, in some cases, these different priorities may come into conflict with one another. Um, the desire to match debt to EBITDA might make the most sense in, in managed um, net cash flows, for example, but may introduce additional effects gain and loss um, if the foreign debts are sitting on a, on a sterling book, um, to give a, a very simplistic example there. Um, Steve, how has the optimal debt profile of essential changed over time? Historically, our approach has been to match currency mix of debt to the currency mix of EBITDA, but ensure that this is consistent with net cash flows. Previously, this was to provide a natural hedge for the leveraged covenant hedging position. This meant that we had to let the value of EBITDA fluctuate against currency movements so as, to, so as to act as the natural offset in the sterling value of net debt. This is easier to do if you're using the syndicated loan market and able to raise currency mix of debt directly. Also, ideally, you should have loan documentation that allows you to re-denominate the currency mix of your debt easily if your EBITDA mix changes over time or as a result of M&A activity. As a public owned company, there's more of a balance in wishing to protect against each of the above considerations that Anne mentioned and try to manage each of these in tandem as far as possible. We have found that the, that the approaching the economic risk first and then trying to look at the appropriate counting treatment as the next step to try to manage all of these together. Our debt profile currency mix has changed over time, but this really reflects the underlying currency mix of our revenue and earnings that has changed over time and as a result of M&A activity. But what we you know, should, should highlight that um, whilst we are able to um, manage the appropriate net debt mix um, to reflect our underlying operational cash flows, um, we still need to have care of the accounting for FX treatment of, of uh, debt and cash because these can go through separate places in the, in the P&L. As Steve has discussed, um, once an optimal debt currency mix is determined, um, there can be primarily two ways that um, companies achieve the desired debt mix. Um, and um, as I mentioned previously, um, the, the, the survey has shown that um, about 40% of companies actually issue foreign debt or, or cross-currency swaps. Um, so an increasingly uh, high number of um, companies from medium to smaller sizes today can have access to foreign debt markets in many cases. Um, so you can see that those are the two um, first um, boxes that you see on the slide there. Um, the third box is uh, with regard to implementation of a cash flow hedging program. Um, so this is essentially once you take into the natural hedges and the considerations of the debt um, or currency of your debt, the residual risk that or, that arrives um, that derives from your operations would would then be hedged by FX forwards or options, and um, F, uh, actually forward contracts is one of the most commonly used 
instrument for companies to hedge um, their currency. And uh, that can be done via a cash flow hedging program, um, and that would typically be used to hedge exposures over um, a shorter term horizon, um, generally up to 18 months. And um, that would be hedging revenue expense forecasts that are less stable over a long term. Um, so you can see that this continuous and dynamic um, hedging program by nature um, can be easily adapted to structural changes. You know, say if you have a refinancing um, that happens in a different currency than, than the previous um, structure, um, that can the the residual risk can be um, recalculated and um, readjusted um, accordingly. However, there can still be changes of perspective that companies need to be mindful of. Um, say a new owner with different priorities and approaches, or when you're integrating with another business um, via a merger. Um, that these operational programs would definitely need to be realigned. So taking another, a deeper look into the first two of this slide, um, when you look at um, issuing debt in a foreign market versus um, synthetically convert your debt via a cross-currency swap, um, we can think about how do companies make decisions between those two alternatives. Um, Depending on market appetite, companies and, and, and again, increasingly smaller companies um, might have access to funding in different markets and currencies. Um, when you're looking at the, the example on the slide um, and you have a 2% credit spread um, in the U.S. or in Eurozone, um, and similarly, your debt in the two markets would have the same fall at 1%. Um, are these two alternatives really the equivalent of each other? Like, would you be indifferent which one of these two debt packages would be um, your chosen um, strategy? In this specific example, say if we take the five-year debt horizon um, as an example, um, both with the 1% embedded floor and both with 2% spread, um, let's start by looking at the floor. Um, a 1% floor on U-LIBOR is costing the company much more than the 1% floor on USD LIBOR because um, U-LIBOR rates today are much lower and, in fact, very negative um, compared to USD LIBOR at the moment. So the difference is actually quite high if you think about um, the, just the value of the floor to start with. Um, currently, the USD floor is worth around 32 basis points, and the Euro um, Euribor floor is 120. So you already can see around 80 basis points of difference um, or higher cost on the on the Euro debt. The next factor to consider is the cross currency basis, and this is essentially the adjustment um, that represents the cost or the benefit of using a cross currency swap to swap from one currency to another. Um, and we can take a look at that here on this graph. Um, this chart essentially represents the historical evolution of um, the Euro-USD cross-currency basis. Um, and it is determined by the preference of investors to pay or receive a particular currency against another over a given tenor, um, and it reflects forces of market supply and demand um, that deviates from the current spot and the interest rate differential that you can observe in the, in the forward market. You can see that during um, the periods of market turbulence and investors' concerns, like in 2008 and 2011, uh, the cross-currency basis went highly negative, um, even beyond 100 basis points. Uh, which means that in those circumstances, and even still so today, um, there are advantages of issuing in dollar and converting your dollar debt to euro via, via cost currency swap, um, as the euro rate would be adjusted by a beneficial basis, um, essentially. As you can see, the five-year example here is a, approximately 43 basis point um, of difference between the two. Um, so this is... a brief um, dive into the technical point to illustrate that the decision of comparing um, the debt currencies across markets would need to be um, quite careful and you need to take into account these various factors 
um, and not just looking at the headline numbers that you receive um, from uh, your potential bank counterparties or bank lenders. With all that in mind, um, regardless of hedging strategies and um, instruments from something very simple like a forward contract to something more complex um, like option or cross-currency swaps uh, or interest rate swaps, um, it's important to keep in mind, especially in terms of changes of, um, of company life cycle, um, that you want to make sure you understand the complexity and the sensitivity of the, of the trade that you're about to do. Um, and um, regardless of, of those instruments, um, when you get an all-in rate, it's important to know that there are many components to it. There's a mid-market level, which um, can now be assumed to be more transparent than it used to be because of all the regulatory requirements um, that we've seen across Dodd-Frank and EMEA. But the reality is, um, Nowadays, you would see more prevalent higher charges uh, like CVA, credit value adjustment, or SBA, uh, funding adjustment, that can be more punitive um, with higher capital requirements on bank counterparties in, in the current environment. Yes, yeah, certainly. We, we've seen, um, in looking at credit cross-currency swaps, um, you know, a few issues that we have to tackle. Um, the most important one was actually the tenor of the cross-currency swap. Um, also, we have to be careful about the credit exercise of the hedge banks as cross-currency swaps are very capital intensive due to the exchange of principles uh, at the beginning and, the, and at the end. And in turn, that actually may influence the, the tenor itself and also the capital costs that banks have to bear um, for, for the instruments. Um, for the tenor of the, or maturity of, of, of the swaps, we firstly start by looking at the maturity of the debt and then also by then saying so when realistically we could potentially refinance that debt um, and also when the earliest we could actually pay down the debt um, and to try and find the sort of the, the point in between. Um, you know, cross-country cross, cross swaps are highly capital intensive and we really then need to understand all the components of the all-in rate so that we can compare capital costs the banks are charging you and also understand the spreads in a, in a transparent manner. Also, must we re realise that different banks have different approaches and different appetites to different currency pairs. The other issue we face uh, as well has been actually considering execution risks. So where you've got a number of banks bidding for your business at the same time, it can be difficult to manage both the bidding process and also the market can go against you just because, just because you have another banks lined up. And so what we undertook with uh, Chatham's help was to arrange, firstly, a market hedge at the outset, and so you focus on just getting one set of documentation in place. And then, at a later date, we arrange a competitive process to actually syndicate out that market hedge amongst a number of counterparties. And so at that stage, the secondary stage, we can just focus on the capital and execution charges and get a, 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 a this later round of execution. And you know, Chatham were quite invaluable in helping us in understanding the right approach and also getting execution um, undertaken in an efficient manner. Um, and just to wrap up, um, so um, in the short amount of time of the webinar, uh, we hope that we were able to provide you some um, um, insights and experiences across companies that we work with, as well as the specific example of Essential, um, about the considerations across um, risk management objectives, um, risk management tools, as well as execution strategies um, when it comes to major life cycle events of a company and how that might affect um, affects risk management strategy. Thank you very much, uh, Anne and Steve. Uh, whilst you've been speaking and giving us uh, a very interesting um, macro and then micro uh, approach to this issue, we've had a number of uh, questions come in, so I'm going to try and get to them uh, straight away. And apologies to all of you who have sent questions in if I am not able to uh, ask and have answered uh, all of the questions. Um, I'd like to start at the, uh, the macro level, if I may, and a question to both of you, given your different experience which is basically around the differences in the risk appetites between private, so to speak, and publicly owned uh, corporations, and in particular, 
the crossover point, and specifically to you, Steve, what was it that determined that you wouldn't do the same risk management when you moved from private to public? So, Anne, perhaps what's your general experience in this first? Sure. Um, that's a great question, and um, I think certainly many of the points that we alluded to earlier um, would be relevant here. Um, so uh, when we think about private versus public companies, um, that can be a variety, a variety of different stakeholders that can come to, into play. So in a private ownership environment, um, you do have a limited number of, uh, of stakeholders and owners that you're, you're catering to. So um, in cases of private equity owners, for example, certain funds might take a view that they might want to gain exposure to certain currencies. And uh, that's a very specific example of cases where you essentially um, won't be too concerned about hedging your, your risk in certain ways because of, um, of your board decision. Um, on the other hand, on the private ownership side, uh, you primarily think about your EBITDA, um, and uh, everything below EBITDA might not be as relevant in, in the um, big picture of your enterprise value um, and thinking about the exit strategy of, um, of your investors. Um, so that can be a, a major determination of, um, of a different approach to risk management. On the, on the publicly listed company um, side, um, you can think about it as having many different investors and uh, the decision then would be to stabilize your, your financials um, and meet analyst expectations or meet your investors' expectations and you wouldn't want to be um, seeing volatility in your, in your net income as much. So, um, that's, and then, that's a very classical point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'll, I'll put it in, in, this, in these terms to Steve. That might be a classical point of view, but institutional investors these days have portfolios in the same way that private investors do. Had you carried over your same risk profile and said to the market, this is who we are, this is what we do, would that have mattered, do you think? Yeah, so um, you know, our, our, we've actually sort of been through a mini journey just since the IPO process. So um, the first engagement we had was with our, uh, you know, our, our uh, private owned uh, investors who still own the bulk of the business, so you, that's always got to be borne in mind as well. Um, so just in terms of saying, you know, this is our FX policy now, you know, should we be looking to engage, you know, uh, review it and, and, and change it? Um, and they had a certain, certain approach, was actually, you know, they're still saying, you know, actually, private versus public, does it really, really, really change? Um, and then your you go through an approach of saying, you know, we've got a certain mix of, of, of currency debt. Do you change that approach, uh, given that you're not just focusing on EBITDA, you're focusing on other components of the P&L? Um, and also, as well, you're more um, careful about the accounting effects of holding currency debt and the associated intercompany debt on your P&L. Um, so we, had, we certainly have that, quite a lot of debate and analysis and, and assistance from, from Chatham. Um, and we, and, we, and, we, and we sort of battered sort of around whether you know, we should change our FX policy or explain much more of what, you know, what is our sources of, of, of FX and really went down that route and then going through the engagement with potential investors and analysts. Um, and that's really, you know, so we've, we've, we've gone through that journey and now having IPO'd, we're now really going through the process of Let's relook at our treasury policy. We've learned, you know, certain things in terms of engagement with um, external parties, um, and we've still got this journey of let's refresh our treasury policy, refresh our FX policy as well. That's that's fair comment. We had a follow-up question on a couple of those points, specifically for you, Steve. One, uh, but also you could comment on these as well, and one on the change from the uh, IS39 accounting to uh, current accounting standards. Did that really make a difference for you? Would you, you get to that at the end? And the second question that I have was, you mentioned a point about currency re redenomination of debt, and someone was, uh, was asking, what type of debt allows you to do that? Okay. So in, in terms of the accounting, actually, you know, under private equity ownership, you, 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 you perfectly honest can get away with you know, quite, quite a lot because our debt was parked in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a company a bit further up the chain. It really wasn't, you know, a, an issue we had to address publicly and, and worry about, you know, below our movements. Um, so that re re really wasn't an issue. We're, you know, we have been sort of focused and, 
uh, you know, in, in looking at, uh, at sort of the accounting effects now of having this huge currency debt and the intercompany debt that sort of fl fl flow through, um, and really try to understand, you know, what we can do and, and putting in place certain um, uh, uh, frameworks to to assist um, the FX uh, movements through the P&L. And yes, yeah, uh, certainly on the accounting side as well, um, we've definitely seen public companies being more concerned about, like Steve mentioned, um, what would happen to the accounting treatment of my risk management decision. And um, it might affect what companies do and, and do not do. So um, an example would be if you issue foreign debt um, and um, the debt is sitting on the, on the sterling book and creating noises below the line in your FX gain and loss, um, would you want to implement a net investment head strategy and designate that under um, under IFRS um, in order to to remove that risk? And that's certainly a valid question. Yeah, uh, and just just kind of the the question of the redenomination of the currency mix of debt. Um, certainly, under the syndicated loan market, um, it is easier to raise debt um, in currency directly. Um, but also what you, we negotiate from time to time when we, we looked at our sort of debt arrangements is the ability to do a redenomination exercise because um, you really don't want to have a, a significant discussion with your banks to do so. You wouldn't have the right to do so. Um, with the refinance we did in April 2015, because of the market amounts we had to issue in, in dollars and euros have marketable amounts, we knew we could have a sterling issuance. Um, so that's where the focus really was on using cross-currency swaps to provide the right uh, currency mix. But obviously that's quite an expensive way of doing so because of the capital costs, etc. that you, you, you need to bear. Well, that sort of was taking me back to where I started uh, uh, asking the question about the, the, the difference between public and private. And clearly that gives you that uh, interesting level of, of flexibility. Uh, another uh, question that, that came through um, was on um, the availability of risk management tools. You talked about some of the ones that are available there. A again, on the public versus private, is it a generic, you can use everything that you want to use, or would you have more preference to using one or the other? Again, Anne, what's your experience uh, generally, and Steve, what's your experience particularly? So at a high level, um, certainly the, the three different tools that we ha are highlighted, highlighted are certainly available to both public and private companies. Certainly to um, Peter's point earlier, um, public companies might have more sensitivity to accounting, for example, and they might care about whether the instrument they use or the strategy they implement um, can qualify for hedge accounting um, and uh, removing the volatility of the market, market market of the hedge. Private companies might have less of a concern of doing so, but regardless, across the board, we do see um, a very frequent usage of all those three tools. Okay. And generally, we've seen a, a bit more flexibility on the, on the public side just because our leverage position is, is much more conservative, um, and that enables you to have you know, a better credit appetite by banks and, you know, in certain instruments, in instruments etc. Um, so we've you know, we found that um, you know, being on the public side you know, has its advantages. And I just want one quick follow-up on that before we draw this to a close. Obviously, if you're doing cross-currency swaps, you're subject to EMIR. Have you found that experience? Well, actually, under the private equity ownership, we, we had um, various uh, entities outside the EU. So that was, whilst we were set up to do certain things, we actually had a very light touch. Which is probably an answer an awful lot of people listening wish they were able to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's important to keep in mind as well that um, now EMEA has a very wide-ranging uh, scope. So even when you're not incorporated in the EU and you're dealing with an EU bank, it's also important to keep in mind that you might be subject to certain... Um, Regulation. Thank you very much for those answers. Uh, my thanks, therefore, to uh, Steve and to Anne for their time, uh, and obviously to Chatham uh, for their sponsorship of this uh, webinar. Thank you, obviously, to everyone online who joined today's session, and I'm sorry if we weren't able to reach your question within the allotted time. As I mentioned at the start, though, we'll be putting up a recording of this webinar on the ATT website, along with the presentations in a couple of days' time, and we'll be sending you all the link to that. And if you have any more questions, particularly of a technical nature, please send them into the ACT and we'll do our best to get them answered for you uh, through our policy and technical team or indeed perhaps through Steve or Anne.
Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to some upcoming events at the ACT calendar as well, and they're on the slide uh, on your screen. But also, if you can spare a moment to provide some feedback on the webinar, I'll be, be very grateful. Please select the feedback widget in red from the bottom bar. The facility will remain open for a short while for you to do this. From all of us here, thank you very much and goodbye.